have our heading. Here we go! From the magic within our hearts, to the adventure beyond the horizon, there is only one kingdom of isolation. Happy Christmas Eve, everybody, and hello to my fellow Disney fans across the world, and welcome to the first of two Christmas specials this year in the Kingdom of Isolation, where in times of trouble, why not isolate yourself with the magic of Disney? This is possibly the best time of year to be consumed in the best way possible by Disney's uh, magic. Uh, Over the weekend, I did go and see uh, Disney's latest offering, Encanto, fantastic soundtrack from Lin-Manuel Miranda once again. And uh, don't worry, he is the latest name to be added to my Legends of Disney series, which I'll get in, which I'll get to later down the road. But nevertheless, time to go for one of my classic King of Isolation episodes and how I've missed using that old school Disney intro. But anyway, uh, like I said, this is the first of two Christmas specials this year, you lucky people. The next special is going to be tomorrow on Christmas Day. Uh, We are recording this Christmas Eve special on December the 12th. Uh, December the 6th. So I've got just under three weeks to get this all uh, put together. But nevertheless, as you can tell by this background and that iconic shooting star in the bagger, which is a series trademark for this series, we are taking our first foray into the world of the Muppets with the Muppet Christmas Carol released in 1992 based on the popular Charles Dickens story, A Christmas Carol. But of course, this being the Kingdom of Isolation, got to have a guest on board for this. Uh, now, uh, my guest today, he has covered many a Disney film um, since I got him on board. Uh, since I got him on board uh, at the beginning of the year, round about then. Um, he's covered films like Alice in Wonderland, The Black Cauldron, Helps Me with the Renaissance, with the silver anniversary of The Hunchback of Notre Dame. And also his most recent appearance was covering Pixar's A Bug's Life, all of which you can find in the top right of your screen in the dedicated Kingdom of Isolation uh, playlist. Since we're a dynamic duo when we do these episodes together, you could see we're Waldorf and Statler today. Alan Sunter! (laughs) Hello there, folks. (laughs) You know the best part about these Christmas specials? We only have to do them once Where's a year. <laughs> <laughs> and there's our Waldorf and Statler joke for this episode. But yes, The Muppet Christmas Carol, an absolute classic for many Absolutely. a Muppet fan. And for those that have a Christmas tradition, like one of my close friends, of watching this film on Christmas Eve every year. Mm-hmm. You know, I think um, for many people... Like for whole generations, this and Mickey's Christmas Carol are their introduction to um, the story of a Christmas Carol. It was certainly my yes. introduction. And, you know, and, and as an introduction, as an introduction, it's pretty damn good. Yes. And uh, and uh, as I was just saying to Alan uh, off camera before we started recording, uh, I haven't actually finished the scores yet. Uh, so we'll get into those at the end, end of the episode. So, um, but uh, yeah, anyway, let's not waste any more time. Let's get, let's get into this as we go through the Muppets at Christmas Carol. But as is tradition in the Kingdom of Isolation, if you guys still haven't seen the film yet, a spoiler alert is now officially in effect. So you've got your classic, you've got your classic Disney opening, but you've also got the Jim Henson's Productions uh, logo there with the star himself, Kermit. And right out the gate, you've got a tr- you've got a tribute there in loving memory of Jim Henson and Richard Hunt. Jim Henson actually passed away a couple of years before this film uh, came out, so directing duties were handed to his son Brian Henson. And uh, Richard Hunt was one of the uh, Muppet performers who sadly passed away from um, 
from AIDS a year before the um, uh, the film was released, so he wasn't able to be involved in the production in any uh, capacity. But it is it is really nice that they that they made tribute to to iconic figures that created uh, these amazing characters. This was actually um, Brian Henson's directorial debut, and apparently he did such a good job of it that Michael Caine didn't even know he hadn't done a film before until about two weeks into filming. Yeah, yes, that, that, is what, that is one of the things that I did find out uh, doing my behind the scenes research, folks. Because yes, I do, mm. I do some behind the scenes research for these episodes now. So just to give them a bit of, oh, yeah. just to add a bit of meat to the, um, uh, the, the episode. But uh, yeah, so we see, we see a number of the uh, main uh, characters, well, the main, some of the main Muppets that are in the um, opening credits. You've, I, mean, I mean, I will say the, the way, the way the title of the film looks, it looks fantastic. I mean, just, I mean, I mean, just all in red, which to be given, which is to, to be given, because uh, because with it being a Christmas film, I mean, I mean, red's one of those colors associated with Christmas, anyway. But um, but I, say, I, I really like how oh, the yeah. um, how they designed the title of the film, and then um, the um, mm. and then you've got the um, then you've got the main cast itself. You've got you've got some of the main Muppets. Uh, you've got. Kermit as Bob Cratchit, Miss Piggy as Emily Cratchit, Gonzo as uh, Charles Dickens, Rizzo the Rat as himself, uh, Fozzie uh, playing uh, Fozzie Wig, and you've got the um, let's say, let's say some of the some of the notable uh, Muppets performers uh, here uh, doing doing puppeteer work: uh, Dave Golds, Steve Whitmere, Jerry Nelson, and Frank Oz. And it was, uh, I was like, one of the things that I found out uh, when it came to uh, seeing how it was filmed, uh, the, the sets were built four feet off the ground to allow room for the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Muppeteers. I'm going to call them Muppeteers for this episode. Hey, hey yes. it works for me. <laughs> um, the, the, the Muppeteers um, to do the, uh, uh, the puppet work um, underneath um, uh, the sets. And... With with some of the, some of the walking shots in particular, the um, uh, the planks were only like two feet wide, so people like uh, so like people like Michael Caine uh, had to walk along those same um, planks without looking down at their feet. And he actually took this in his stride because he actually said in an interview that uh, he he treated this like he was in a Shakespeare uh, production. And he, and he certainly took it in his stride because Michael Caine is, of course, the main man, Ebenezer Scrooge. Mm-hmm. And so, the casting was the casting was going to be um, a little different to begin with because uh, yes. for for the ghosts, uh, they were thinking of casting the classic Muppets as them. I believe they were thinking of Miss Piggy, Piggy to be the ghost, the ghost of, of Christmas, Christmas present, present and Gonzo and Gonzo. As, as the ghost, the of, ghost Christmas of Christmas present of Go- ghost of Christmas I- yet to come, with his nose and vi- sticking out of the hood. <laughs> yeah. and, but and they I decided did. they wanted they decided they just wanted to preserve the mood and tone of the book, so just decided yes. yeah, just make some new, just make some new guys. Mm. Yes, um, but um, so a, so a couple of other things regarding um, uh, King, uh, he. Yeah, he said that uh, this was one of his most memorable roles that he has done throughout his uh, uh, entire uh, career. And of course, when you've got a big name like Michael Caine, it is tradition here that I go through his uh, resume. A couple of his most well-known roles from back back in the 60s, uh, 60s and 70s, you've got Alfie and of course the original Italian job where you are only supposed to blow the bloody doors off. Oh, right, there we go. There we, there we go. I say, I say, it, it looked like your camera had stopped for a moment there, and I thought, right, that's a little concerning. But yeah. Yeah, but you, like was... you, were, um, you were a little bit frozen on my end too. Ah, not ideal. But anyway, uh, as, as, as I was saying, um, as I would say, uh, a couple of his most well-known roles from like the 60s and 70s, uh, one being Alfie and, of course, the original Italian job where you are only supposed to blow the bloody doors off. <laughs> oh, no. 
But uh, ah, there we go. That's what we're after. Uh, 176 credits to his name, including two Oscars to his name as well. Um, yeah. He's got, a, he's got a couple of films. On, he's got a few films on the way right now. He's oh, got... freezing a little bit. Oh, right. uh, that might be from having too many tabs open on Chrome. While you do that, I'll um, say quite a fun quote I found from Michael Caine huh? about playing this role. He said, I must say, I don't really like playing this sadistic old villain with all these lovely little muppets who everybody loves so much and I just hate a lot of them it's really great <laughs> yeah um so yeah um so I've he's got frozen his... on my side I don't know if I'm frozen on his oh dear. Uh, flip me and these technical difficulties uh Maybe it's those maybe it's, maybe it's those spirits causing a little Well, that just happened. It decided uh, yeah. <laughs> the soft yeah, yeah, it decided to crash. Fantastic. Just what we need. Oh god. Uh, not ideal. Uh still I'm not gives you lemons and all that. There. Uh, yep. Right, that should be us. Should be us now, uh, but yeah. Uh, what I say that? I say that, uh, what was that? What was that quote you were seeing uh, regarding um, Kane and Scrooge? Again? But uh, this role, oh, he just said, "I must say, I, I really do like playing this sadistic old villain with all these little lovely little muppets who everybody loves so much, and I just hate the lot of them. It's really great." <laughs> yeah, you see, you see the fact, the fact you could, you could, you could tell how well he was able to uh, portray that character uh, throughout the film. Uh, but yeah, he was it his um, his two Oscar wins came from supporting actor roles, one from his film uh, Hannah and Her Sisters in 1986. Um, Sigourney Weaver actually accepted the award on his behalf because, uh, yeah, of all the films he was recording, uh, he was filming at the time, Jaws the Revenge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not great. Not yeah. great. But uh, but uh, and he, and he actually said regarding it that uh, I haven't seen it, but by all accounts it is terrible. However, I have seen the house it built and it is terrific. So he must have got paid. So he must have got paid a fair amount to do the worst Jaws film in the entire series. Yes. So I suppose you know it could have been worse. Yep. That is true. Uh, his other best, his other Oscar win came from the Cider House Rules in 1999. Um, and he also had four other nominations on top of that. Alfie in 1966, Sleuth in 72, Educating Rita in 1983, and The Quiet American in 2002. Now, the four nominations he got on top of his two wins were for the leading actor role so it's interesting that he got his oscar wins for his supporting roles and only got nominations for his leading roles mm. but still that's that's not bad four oscar nominations and two wins under his belt anyway no not bad going and and of course for um uh whole groups he is their favorite alfred pennyworth in the dark knight trilogy yes which uh, which uh, which rest assured, folks, I am going to get, which I'm going to be, um, which I'm going to be uh, getting around to watching eventually because I do have the Dark Knight trilogy um, in my collection, and then uh, next year being ten years since the climax of that um, trilogy makes perfect. The opportunity is right there. Yeah, I also um, highly recommend checking out the uh, fan series, the Joker blogs. Okay. That, blogs. It's a fan series set in the same universe as the Dark Knight trilogy, but right. uh, it's a but from the Joker's point of view. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, that's very my, interesting and very well made. Add that to my watch list. Uh, so anyway, the um, 
some of the other roles that he's had throughout his nearly 60 plus his nearly 60 year career um there's been a third now you see me film uh, announced where he'll be reprising his role of arthur tressler who he played in the first two films lord redbrick in sherlock gnomes uh, he was in Four Kids in It, which was based on the Jacqueline Wilson uh, book. Jacqueline Wilson, for for those of uh, our generation, will know her best as uh, the author of the Tracy Beaker books, which got turned into a phenomenal TV series on CBBC. Uh, he's been part of the Kingsman series as well in The Secret Service in 2014. Interstellar that same year um, as well. Alfred, we've already mentioned from uh, the Dark Knight trilogy. Um, he was also he also had his he also made his first appearance as Lord Redbrick in Nomeo and Juliet. And yes, it's exactly what you think it is, folks. Um, he was Finn McMissile in Cars Two, so he's got a Pixar credit to his name as well. Don't worry, I'll get to the, I'll get to the more. I'll get to more Pixar films in the new year. The next episode, after, uh, once I get everything else up, will be Finding Nemo. That's the next episode I'll be um, uh, doing. And um, uh, something in 2007. Uh, a TV documentary series, uh, Freedom, the History of the US. Uh, six episodes in 2003. Uh, Oh, he was even. Oh my! He was even in Austin Powers. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> gold, gold. He was in Gold Member as Nigel Powers, who I can only assume was Austin's dad. That's right, and and he had um, one of my favorite lines in the series. And that, uh, uh, let me tell you this, Gold Member. There's only two things in this world I can't stand: people who are intolerant of other people's cultures and the Dutch. <laughs> Oh, yes. oh, just really... uh, he was also in a TV miniseries of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea as Captain Nemo in uh, 1997. Uh, what other big roles is he had? He was, he was in a TV movie adaptation of, the, um, of Jekyll and Hyde in 1990, where he would be Henry Jekyll and Edward Hyde uh, as oh, well. Oh, that would be cool. Yeah. Dirty Rotten Scoundrels in 1988 as Lawrence Jameson, um, H Hoagie in Jaws of Revenge, which we've already mentioned, uh, Mortwell in Mona Lisa in 1986, uh, the, uh, the Jigsaw Man, uh, Educating Rita, we've, uh, we've already mentioned, one of his two Oscar wins. Um, this, film, this film I've seen, uh, he was Brad Crane, in 1978, in a film called *The Swarm*, which was um, which was one of those uh, killer bee um, movies, and there's been a number of those over the years. Um, not not very well received, but um, let's just leave it at that. Uh, Harry and Walter go to New York in 1976. Uh, *Battle of Britain* in '69. The original Italian Job in 1969. Uh, that same year, he was, he was in a, he was uh, Cornelius in a TV movie, Male of the Species, and he also reprised that role um, in the ITV Sunday Night Theatre that same year as well. Uh, ITV Play of the Week as well, so he was, um, so he's, so he's got a few stage credits to his name uh, as well. Uh, between 1961 and 1964, George Grant in The Other Man, Willie Mossop in Hobson's Choice in 1962, and in 1961, P.C. Wimbush in Ring of Truth. So that's a very extensive resume. He goes all the way back to the fifth... Actually, scratch that. I was about to say 50s. He goes back to 1946 for an uncredited role for his very first, um, his very first uh, acting role, uh, a TV movie called Morning Departure, where he played a T-boy. Nice. So, uh, so let's see. Uh, so let's see. Uh, 
What did he say? Oh. Guy's been busy. Yes. Like I said, with, well, like I said, with, with 176 credit, acting credits to his name. Uh, but anyway, um, so we get the first song of the, um, we get the first song of the film uh, after uh, Gonzo introduces himself as Charles Dickens and Rizzo as uh, himself. And the dynamic yeah, and between I've, these two the, the reason. The, the reason they cast um, Gonzo specifically as uh, Charles Dickens was because uh -huh. uh, they wanted to include more of the actual prose from the book. Like a lot yes. of um, a lot of the narration comes directly from the source material. That, so that that is that is very well played on the um, on the uh, production scenes uh, part. Absolutely. To, to be able to stay as faithful to the source material as possible throughout the um, nearly 90 minute runtime. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, uh, we'll say, so, and uh, while I'm on, uh, it, and uh, one, one of the other um, uh, key crew members was uh, Jerry Jewell, uh, who was actually, who's the one in charge of the um, screenplay. So massive praise to him for being able to keep his faithful to the source material um, as possible and those who know me well know how much I love my film soundtracks and this is no difference you've got Miles Goodman helping with the score and Paul Williams uh, composing the songs so uh, I just realized there that's um, another DC connection since Paul Williams voiced the Penguin on Batman the Animated Series. And we have talked about the animated series previously on this uh, show as well. See, it all, it all connects. Yep. Indeed it does. Uh, so, so uh, like I said, we get, we, get the first, we get the first song of the soundtrack after we get the, um, the intro from... Um, uh, I think, uh, Gonzo's referred to as uh, Charles Dickens for a majority of the film, so we'll go with that. Uh, Dickens and Rizzo, we get the introduction from uh, them. Uh, the song, the song that sees as being introduced to Scrooge is, well, just Scrooge. And one of my favorite lines from this film is, there goes Mr. Humbug, there goes Mr. Grimm. If they gave a prize for being mean, the winner would be him. And, uh, Such and that, a good line. Such yeah. a good song. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, can we class it as a villain song? I, I suppose so. Yeah. So uh, my favorite line, actually, from the song is the very end lyrics. If being means a way of life you practice and rehearse, uh -huh. then all that work is paying off because Scrooge is getting worse. And then, and then at the end of the song, he turns around and is like, what did you say? And then they just carry on with their business <laughs> as if nothing even happened. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. I was like, I was like, again, I, was like, I, mean, I, mean, just, I mean, just that dead, expressionless look that he delivers throughout the, throughout the film. It's it very is, cold, a cold look. Yes. I think that, that cold look is just intimidating in a lot of ways because they know how bad this guy can be. Mm. But uh, where do we get to next after that? Uh, he's, uh, he's, uh, he didn't, we don't see Bob Cratchit uh, for the first time work, working in the, um, the office that um, Scrooge is in. And you've got, you've got all these you've got these um, bookmakers who are portrayed by the um, uh, the Muppet Rats, and um, Cratchit tries to convince Scrooge to let him have the day off the next day because the next day happens to be um, Christmas Day. But um, but again, even even Kane's line delivery here is very intimidating because and cold as well because you're just like 
Yeah, th- yeah, this, yeah. If this is not an indication that he does not like Christmas, I don't know what does. A poor excuse. <laughs> a poor excuse. Um, a poor excuse for a man on the December the twenty fifth. A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every twenty fifth of December. Yes, there we go. But uh, that being that being said, uh, he he manages to win Scrooge over, which is probably one of the only nice things he does in this early stage in the film. Uh, that he does actually give uh, Cratchit uh, the day off, but before this, a, a, a funny, funny little bit from the um, from from the bookmakers, um, an extra shovel of coal uh, for the fire. They're talking about how all their uh, their pens have become uh, inksicles, their assets are frozen. Uh, how how would the book like, like to be, to be suddenly, suddenly unemployed? And then they end up in these co- these Hawaiian esque costumes. This is my island in the sun. Oi, oi. <laughs> I love that joke so much. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, just, I mean, that is probably one of the best 180s that, um, that, that I've seen there from from these films because i mean i mean i mean just just the seriousness and then you get this this instant 180 switch it's just absolutely beggar's belief when you get to editing this video you need to um uh intersperse these cuts with the technical difficulties thing and <laughs> oh yeah yeah that, that's that's going in don't worry folks that is definitely that is definitely going in excellent excellent yeah uh sorry where are we so um yeah uh, we're all yeah we get the introduction of uh scrooge's nephew fred yes who is pretty who is pretty much the exact um, opposite of Scrooge? Yeah, yeah, full full of Christmas, full of Christmas spirit. Wishing everybody a, a merry Christmas as well. And you also, we there's, also, yep. There's one um, detail about Fred that the movie uh, misses out. Um, the ah. reason why Scrooge resents Fred so much in the book is that um, uh, Fred's Fred's mother, Scrooge's sister, Fan, died in childbirth. Ah. Yes, that, that has... Yeah, that did get mentioned. Um, I did spot that in the, um, in the behind-the-scenes stuff uh, on mm-hmm. the IMDb uh, trivia page, um, which, which, I'll, which I'll touch on then, which I'll touch on shortly regarding that. Yes. Um, because because there is a character that ha- that actually fills that gap effectively, but again we'll get into that um, uh, shortly. Uh, the two uh, we get we get two uh, we get um, uh, we get we get two more gentlemen uh, coming into the uh, coming into Scrooge's uh, workplace, uh, who are played by uh, Doctor Bunsen Honeydew and Beaker. Um, th- th- those th- those those sign sketches on the Muppet Show are absolutely hilarious. Um, you'll say Beaker just. Uh, oh, they are. Yeah. Um, oh, that's right, Beaker. <laughs> yeah, but um, and uh, and then and then and and then just and then, and and another another piece of loathsome um, uh, what's the word we're looking for? Uh, another piece of loathsome treatment from uh, Scrooge. He tosses a wreath at um, Bean Bunny, who's singing um, singing a Christmas carol. Uh, uh, good King. How do you Wences pronounce Lass. that last? How do you pronounce that last? Wenceslas. That's the one. Wenceslas. Good King Wenceslas. He, he sings that, uh, and then <laughs> it's, it's, it's it's another classic gag. You're just singing happily, and then you've got you've got this terror figure, right, and then he's the like starts to slow down, and then eventually. Oh. Stops. He tosses Penny for the song, the wreath at him, and and then and then once the day is done, uh, Scrooge uh, heads back home, and um, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, the start of the nightmare fuel, because you have Jacob Marley's head morphing from this doorknob. 
and he lets out this huge wing. And it, it does unsettle Scrooge. Yeah, it unsettles everyone. Yep. Um, but that, uh, but while, but of course, while all that's, but of course, while all that's happening, um, we've we've got we've got another we've got another fantastic song here. Uh, one more sleep, one more sleep to Christmas, which is where this shot comes into play, and this and the signature trademark of the series. At some point, at some point during uh, the Muppets films, and um, you actually see a shooting star uh, across the sky at some point during a majority of the um, uh, of the Muppets films. So I say it's it, it's a it's a great trademark for for the um, uh, for the series to have. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But um, but of course, um, but I say, but back to Scrooge. We have um, we have uh, Waldorf and Statler coming into play here as Jacob and Robert Marley. Robert was actually created for this film so we could have Waldorf and Statler. Do their um, classic um, uh, classic gags. Um, shtick. Cl classic shtick, yes. Uh, and then we get the next song of the film, Marley and Marley. And we, and then towards. Such a catchy the, song. Yes, we're Marley and Marley. Marley and Marley. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then towards the end of, towards the end of the song, you see these, you see the chains that they're, um, they're wrapped up in. And they start to, they start to wrap around um, Scrooge. And then you also have these wailing money boxes come into play as well, uh, just just to sort of like further drive home. Yeah, this guy's greedy and he's not ashamed of it. Uh, but this but this is actually an interesting little nod to uh, a, a music group, uh, Bob Marley and the Wailers. Ah. And um, yeah, uh, Jacob and uh, Jacob and Robert they they tell they tell Scrooge about the uh, three. Christmas spirits that are going to be um, paying him a visit, if you will. Um, the first one, go to Christmas past, will be at the at the strike of one. And like I say, it, it is like I say, it is very. It is, I, say, I mean, yeah, like you said, it's a catchy song, but in a way, it does have a fair bit of foreshadowing towards the end of the film, where if he does, where if Scrooge doesn't change his ways, he's going to be alone for the rest of his days. Yeah, wrapped up in chains just like them. Yeah, exactly. But um, I think what one of one of the I think this is one of the things I love about this film uh, is the fact that how well each of the Muppets fits the role that they've been given, and we haven't mm -hmm. even met all the Muppets yet, or all the main ones, because yeah. there's still like one or two more that we're still to see. Mm. Speaking of Muppets, when I was doing my research, I found that this film used 280 Muppets. That's a lot. That's a lot of Muppets, folks. And believe it or not, believe it or not, there were even more in the next film, four years later, Muppet, Muppet Treasure, Treasure Island. Treasure Island. Four, 400 Muppets in that one. And <laughs> um, yeah, uh, that's it. Yeah, which which reminds me, I need I need to I need to work something out regarding uh, covering the the Muppets films later down the road. But I've still got the I've still got the Pixar films to do, and I've still got the uh, uh, Disney films uh, to get through as well. Yes, yes. Yeah, so still got those to get through. Uh, and th and then of course once that's out of the way, um, the episodes might be less regular because because you because um because how often the Disney and Pixar release their films. I mean you get like one or two from each every year. But rest assured, they will be covered on the on this series um, uh, in in due course. I'll just be giving it a uh, sort of like three month window to allow as many people to see it um, as um, as possible because we had that three month window for some of the films that they released on Disney Premier Access before they became available to all subscribers, like Ryan and the Last Dragon, uh, towards the beginning of this year. Mm. Um, but uh, let's. Um, how else are we? Uh, free spirits for the night. Yes, uh, we get we get a childlike spirit for this first Christmas spirit, the um, uh, Ghost of Christmas Past, um, and this this was actually this was actually one of the puppets that was actually designed from scratch to 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 make this uh, character. Now, I will say when they when they're flying through the sky, um, 
shortly after she introduces herself. Uh, I will say, yes, you can act, uh, with this being made in 1992, it was actually filmed between June and August of 1992. So they only, so they would have only had about like three, four months to edit the film together, get all, get all the visual effects and everything like that in time for its release. But still, to be able to film it over the course of about eight to eight, eight, nine, maybe about, about eight weeks, about a couple of months, and still have like three or four months to be able to edit the film in time for its release. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, with this sort of film, it, it, it would have been relatively easy to edit anyway, because with it being live action and not much in the way of um, like visual effects, like for things like the MCU and things like that. Yeah. Those, those take ages to put together. Um, they do. Yeah. But, um, but I say, and speaking of speaking of yeah. flying, I was just going to say the um, uh, that pretty cool looking floating effect yeah. of the uh, Ghost of Christmas Past. That comes from the way they filmed it. They um, yes. had this uh, this huge tank of uh, baby oil, if I'm not mistaken, that they filmed it in. But they felt that that was a bit too tricky afterwards for cleaning purposes. So they instead switched it to a tank of water. And that's how you get this cool, like, otherworldly floaty quality to the, oh. the, ghost's, the ghost's clothes. And, and it looks really, really cool. Ah yes, yeah. Say so, so for the for the for the floating of the uh, uh, the Ghost of Christmas Past. I mean, that is really again really well played on the production team's uh, parts. But, but like yeah. I said, when when they're actually when they're actually flying through through the sky, um, and I think you, you can you can see relatively clearly that they did have like they did have like um, wires attached and uh, and, green, and a green screen. I mean, I mean, I mean, it's, I mean, it's a lot more obvious today. Uh, yeah, but that, but there's, but that being said, it's, it's still really well done. How, uh, like you said, with how they managed to achieve the, um, the floating effect for the Ghost of Christmas Past. Yeah, like you know that there are some effects you see nowadays, and you think, oh well, that looks uh, so obvious nowadays, but. Would it have looked as obvious back then? No, it wouldn't have. It wouldn't have. No. I mean, there are some effects that you see in, at least from some of the movies I've seen, where mm -hmm. you can obviously tell that nobody would ever be fooled by something like that. But something yeah. like, you know, yeah. the green screens in this for the time, mm -hmm. very impressive. Yeah, absolutely. So we so we get transported to um, the past and the, and the first... The first instance of this uh, past trip is we see a younger Scrooge um, at in his classroom, just focusing on doing his work rather than uh, celebrating Christmas. So that, which, which again further ties into what you mentioned earlier from the source material that uh, that he's always in some capacity hated Christmas. Mm. But uh, but this is this is where the this is where the uh, the character replacement comes into play that I mentioned briefly earlier. Uh, you mentioned Fan, who was the um, um, Scrooge's sister. Yes, uh, she is replaced by um, Scrooge's head headmaster at the time, uh, Sam the Eagle. <laughs> uh, but we also uh, but then. But then, as but then, as time goes on, you see, you see the the you can actually um, Dickens actually states that uh, the um, that his classroom is getting older and it is starting to decay. Um, but then we um, but then we transform to when he was then we transport ourselves to when he was um, uh, a, a young uh, a younger blah, a, a a younger adult version of them. Um, Scrooge with his uh, fiance at the time, and uh, this is where this is where we get um, for, for a lot of fans with this uh, particular uh, deleted song. Um, mm. uh, the the love is uh, the love is gone. That's the um, deleted song. Um, it has it has managed to make its way onto like various uh, home media releases since the film came out, but it's never been shown. 
when it's um, when it comes to uh, TV airings or on Disney Plus. But the deleted song is there in the extras tab for um, for the film on uh, Disney Plus. And uh, yeah, I will say this is the fir- um, this is the first time I actually listened to the song uh, today, and it is. It, it is it is a real gut punch of um uh, of emotion because uh, Scrooge is again still focusing on his business trying to get the best possible future for his fiance at the time. But um, but but because of that, he's now become more obsessed with money than yeah. caring about her. Essentially, exactly. And you know, I first watched this movie on um on video when I was uh-huh. a young and, and and that was one of the ones which had the song deleted. And it wasn't until years later where I was looking into it and I was like, there's another song? But yeah. I, I at first um, assumed that the song had been removed because I don't know, they felt it interfered with the pacing or something. But apparently um, according to a quote by uh, Brian Henson, it was removed at the request of Jeffrey Katzenberg because Apparently, uh, children in the test audience were a bit fidgety. Brian Henson said, Katzenberg never forced me to do anything, but he said, do you see how antsy these kids are getting? It's just a little too adult emotional for little kids to stay connected. The movie certainly plays well without the song, but but I obviously preferred having the song in. I think it's good for kids to be pulled into deeply emotional moments, even if they feel slightly awkward about it when they're in a movie theater. And I completely agree. Yeah, because like, like, um, one, one other thing that uh, that was brought up, um, he did he did consider it to be uh, Katzenberg did consider it to be too sad for uh, young children, but uh, there is there is some hope for fans of that particular song that it could be reinstated for potentially future re-releases into cinemas. And it, it, and it is playing in cinemas right now, folks. Uh, and I mm-hmm. uh, hopefully all going to plan, I might be able to see it later this week. Nice. Um, and speaking of re-releases, the actress who played Belle, Meredith Braun, she yeah. re-recorded the song in 2017 for her Ooh. album named When Love Is Gone. Ah, that's, that's, really, well, that's really well done. Mm. I'm, actually, I'm actually tempted to. I'm actually tempted to listen to that re-release version now. Yeah, do. Yeah, but um, I say, with, I say, with the film's 30th anniversary just around the corner, it's a perfect opportunity right there to get that scene added into future re-releases. Absolutely. Hashtag release the love is gone cut. <laughs> release the insert name here cut. <laughs> Oh, we we actually we actually ended up making one of those um, hashtag jokes uh, in uh, I believe it was the Great Mouse Detective episode. Release the tangent cuts. Probably, Pro- no, yeah, as, probably. As, 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 I know, I know, we did it for one of the episodes we've done together previously. You're, you're right. That I remember that now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and and they'll probably keep on coming. Just just saying it right now. Indeed. <laughs> Yeah, ever, ever since the ever since it originally started with release the Snyder cut for how poorly received the original cut of uh, Justice League was. Oh, don't even get me started, man. <laughs> yeah, it's um. But uh, the next, uh, but the next stage, the next stage of this trip. Well, oh, uh, uh, that's that, that seems at the end of the. Uh, in between that, we also have a trip to uh, Fozzie Wigs uh, Christmas. Uh, party um, and and it is mm. a play on the uh, on Mr. Fezziwig from the uh, original and a, source material. And a slight a slight change from the book is that in the movie, um, Fozziwig is the owner of a rubber chicken factory, whereas um, ah, yes. in the whereas in the original book, Mr. Fezziwig is mm-hmm. a money lender just like Scrooge but a much more compassionate and more caring one yeah and and, and you've and you've also got you've also got this you've also got this christmas band um playing music uh, in the background at one point during this scene as well and 
and you've got Animal with this drum kit set up, and he on, he's only allowed to play the triangle. You can feel the pain of him not being able to go all out. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and then and then he and then he reaches a point where he just snaps and just goes ah blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, classic animal right there. Uh, uh, there oh is yeah. A, there is an inter- there is a cameo in this scene that um, that I didn't know about until doing research earlier today. Um, former tennis player Greg Rosetsky makes a cameo in this in this scene. Ah. Um, yeah, he's, yeah, he's seen in the rear of the party scene during, during that, um, uh, during that flashback. Ah. So, uh, very interesting that we had a cameo from uh, a not really well-known tennis player at the time. Because uh, Greg Rosetsky, originally born in Canada, uh, and then, and then uh, became a, and then, uh, became a, a British citizen, represented uh, the UK from uh, 1995 until the end of his uh, uh, career. Still, 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 very, still, very big pundit on the um, uh, the BBC's coverage of Wimbledon uh, every year, uh, alongside the likes of uh, Tim Henman, uh, Boris Becker, and uh, Mr. John. You cannot be serious, McEnroe. I do, I do love giving those sort of nicknames to people. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, um, but 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 one of my personal favourites that I managed to um, uh, piece together. Um, uh, this is after watching Luca for the first time a few weeks ago on Disney Plus. Um, in the UK version of that film, Mister Gino, if my grandmother had wheels, she would have been a bike. The Campo plays uh, plays a priest for a, a handful of lines in that film. Uh, in the UK ah. version, anyway. Um, but um, yeah. Uh, that, but yeah, that that Ghost of Christmas Past uh, flashback is out of the way. Uh, then the clock strikes two, and we get the Ghost of Christmas Present. Uh, now I'm trying to, I'm trying to think. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm trying to think the uh, the name of the Muppets that plays the Ghost of Christmas Present because. Oh, that's that was another um, specially created Muppet for uh, oh. for the movie. Okay. And it was done, and it was done by using um, uh, a man in a full bodysuit. While I think it might have been, uh, uh, who was it now? Uh, yeah, a, a Jerry Nelson um, controlled ah. the facial controlled the facial expressions via remote control and voiced the character. Ah, interesting. So, so that's that's interesting that we that's it. so that's like two specific that's two special Muppets designed uh, for the film. I mean, on a technicality, you could have a third with the uh, the Ghost of Christmas yet to come. Mm. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, that, I mean, anyway. But um, but of course, in, in the source material, it's often called it's often called the Ghost of Christmas Future. But um, but here, it does make more sense to call it the Ghost of Christmas yet to come. Well, to, to me, anyway. No, I'm pretty sure um, uh, they do use the term "Ghost of Christmas" yet to come more than "Christmas Future" in the the in novel. Material. I'm I'm pretty sure. Bearing in mind, folks, I haven't actually read. Bearing in mind, folks, I haven't actually read the source material. But uh, I, I went. But uh, when I'm editing this, when I'm editing this episode, I will be sure to get that little uh, text box um, to yes. give the uh, clarification. Yeah, but yes, um, but yes, we get another, we get another, we get another fantastic, um, we we get another fantastic uh, song here. It, it feels like Christmas. And yep, I absolutely love this song. Yeah, it was like the season of the heart, a special time of uh, sharing. It, I was like, that that's up there as one of my favorite lines from uh, uh, from that song. And mm-hmm. and wait, wait, hang on, what's this? Scrooge. Enjoying himself? Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. I knew you'd say that. Can you tell if we've watched Airplane once or twice? <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but yeah. Um, but yeah. Um, 
I say, I say that that must have come about after the um, after the realization that um, uh, Scrooge has messed up in the past, mm. and and then and then see, and then see, seeing the um, ghost of um, Christmas present, uh, I say he comes across as a jolly old Santa. The ghost of Christmas present does. He does. And and then, and then he actually and then he actually visits. Um, uh, Bob Cratchit's house, and this is where we actually see a Miss Piggy as Emily Cratchit for the first time in the film, about 53 minutes into the film, and she's got that classic Miss Piggy sass describing um, oh, yeah. Scrooge. Um, what, what, are some, what are the things she comes out with? I'll drink to Mr. Scrooge, even though he's odious, stingy, and badly dressed! <laughs> Yeah, that's a, 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 another clip that was that was another clip that was used in the uh, the, the trailer for the um, uh, for the film. Yep. But um, I love how I love how when when she says badly dressed, her two daughters gasp like that one is the most ooh ooh that that one's the biggest pun. That one's the biggest insult. <laughs> yeah, <It's>, um, <laughs> but yeah, um, but I think. Um, so there's there's one there's one particular bit I found really uh, interesting as far as uh, getting that scene put together because you see a shot of uh, Kermit Bob Cratchit use the film use the film characters not the Muppet names um, <laughs> and uh, Tiny Tim on um, Cratchit's um, shoulder um, they actually had something along the lines of like ten puppeteers to operate the limbs and the mouths. Um, and you also had this uh, ro- this spinning drum to give the illusion of um, to give the illusion of uh, Cratchit walking down the street. So I say again, I say it's it's amazing how much effort they went to to make this to make those sort of shots. Um, possible and, and that's it's one of the reasons why i feel the behind the scenes stuff does not get enough credit but yeah like i say because the amount of effort they go through to make those sort of shots possible mm-hmm. but we also find out that uh, tiny tim is actually very ill and then um, I, I i'm i'm still trying to piece together what illness he has specifically yeah, I I don't know for certain because I have read I don't, the book, I don't think but, but, but a long a long time ago I read the book, so I can't remember everything about it. But probably one of those. I don't think they. No, I don't think so. The illness that he has. No, probably one of those, um, you know, illnesses that were very much like abundant in Victorian times. So it just. The kind of thing where Charles Dickens probably didn't even need to specify. They'll probably just know. Oh, he's he's got the tuberculosis or something like that. Yeah. You know? Is it because because yeah because you actually see him with um with sort of like, um a, 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 crutch. A, a support crutch to help him with his um uh, with his movement, and then and then towards the end of the um and then towards the end of the next song, uh, which is uh, bless us all. You actually, you actually see you actually see him coughing uh, quite badly, which mm. um, which uh, which gives us the which gives us the impression. I mean, I mean, it doesn't take Sherlock Holmes to fill in the blanks on this one. It gives us the impression that he's um, he's coughing into his um, uh, handkerchief, and you get the impression that he's actually coughing up blood. Yeah, but of course, but of course, that would be far too graphic for the youngsters to watch. Yeah, that that's a no no. Yeah, that, 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 yeah, de- yeah, yeah, definite no-no, especially when you've got characters as iconic as the Muppets. Yeah. But, um, but I say, but I say, well, Muppets, one of the things that Muppets things do that not did, bleed. Yeah, one of the things that did surprise me about uh, about this Muppet uh, this um, Muppet production compared to like previous Muppet projects that in that have scenes that involve Kermit and Miss Piggy together, she doesn't she doesn't do her um, classic. Smacking of Kermit halfway across the screen. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess because the the Cratchits are in a good relationship. Yes. 
un unlike every other unlike every other project before or since. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um <laughs> and, and I and I actually and I actually put into the I actually put into my uh, uh, my film notes here, which uh, the bullet the film note bullet points double up as my, my script here, effectively. Uh, classic Miss Piggy. Uh, oh wait, change that. Emily Cratchit. Again, use yes. the use the film characters' names, not the Muppet names. <laughs> I know it's tricky. Yeah, <laughs> but um, but that but that being said, um. We, we're reaching the end of uh, the Ghost of Christmas Presents, a time with, uh, with Scrooge, and you've got, and you've got Rizzo uh, ringing, uh, ringing the bell with Dickens doing the uh, narration in the background. Um, and, and, then, and then you've got these, um, these, you've got these sparkles, which, which look like uh, Christmas lights, um, to show mm. the Ghost of Christmas Presents um, fading away. And then... And then you get this huge rolling cloud um, near, near the churchyard uh, coming in. And this is where we see a very imposing figure in the form of the ghost of Christmas yet to come. Mm. Who, just to make it even more uh, imposing, doesn't say a thing. He, use, he lets his hand, yeah. he lets his act, he lets his hand actions speak for themselves. And again, the again the um, the score at this point in the film further adds to the intimidating nature of this final spirit. Oh yeah. But um, one what, what of the, one of the most one of the most heartbreaking parts of this uh, after after we see that incredible spiral transition. I, I love. The transitions they have in between the scenes uh, with the with the spirits, I say, especially this last one. We've got that spiral into the um, into the Christmas that's yet to come, and everybody, you know, I say, I say, oh, everybody that's on the street, they are celebrating the fact that uh, somebody has gone, and 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 Scrooge is Scrooge is standing there like confused, like. Who are they? Who are they to on about? And then they go back. To, they they head to um, the Cratchit house, and sadly, Tiny Tim is gone, and all that's left is the scarf and the crutch. And I'm pretty sure there's a hat in there as well somewhere. Yeah, that's right. In an absolutely heartbreaking scene. Cue the waterworks, folks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I then. And, uh, and 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 Emily actually actually says that no, it's, no, I'm not crying. It's just the um, it's just the uh, fire from the lamp that's um, stinging my eyes. All day. The, the, yeah, like she feels like she needs to be you know strong in front of her kids, but yeah, you know, as as most parents as most parents would at at, at that at, when something like that happens, they like always yeah. always trying their best to be strong in front of their um. In front of their kids, yeah. But um, and then the last sec, and then the last part here of this is when we head to the graveyard, and we see this is this is when the realization hits home that he needs to change, otherwise. This is what's going to happen. Mm. Where Scrooge, or where the where the uh, Ghost of Christmas yet to come, he points to a, one particular gravestone, and then Scrooge wipes off the uh, the snow uh, the snow off it, and then he starts recognizing the letters, and he's like, "This is mine," and then he just breaks, I'm... and then he just breaks down. Yeah, when he realizes I'm the one whose death caused so much joy for those people earlier. Yeah, and it's and and it's at that point where he's where he says, "Yeah, right, okay, I will change." And then, and then, and then you see him like about to fall face first onto the ground, and then you get this you get this jump cut, and he all he falls face first onto his bed, 
and it's the following morning, Christmas morning. And he's amazed that he's managed to, he's, he's amazed that spirits managed to get all that work done in just one night. So, so, he's, so he's, he's, he's dancing around his room. He's uh, light as a feather, merry as a schoolboy, among other things. Um, and then, mm-hmm. and then of course you've, and then of course you've got one of the many gang running gags throughout this film. Uh, you've got Rizzo and Dickens on the windowsill. Do you think it's safe for us to be up here? Scrooge is safe. What could happen, what could happen now? Yeah. Doors, uh, windows open. <laughs> Ah! <laughs> uh, so, uh, another one of my, another one of my favorite gags that they had was um, when you've got Dickens trying to light the lamp. Hey, 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 hey! Light the lamp! Light the lamp! Light the lamp! Light the lamp! <laughs> <laughs> Try saying that three times fast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, I say, uh, I say, Scrooge just opened the window. He sees uh, Bean Bunny, uh, asks him what um, asks him what day it is, and he's. And then Bean Bunny's like, why, it's Christmas Day. And that's when Scrooge realizes, yeah, we've managed to get this done in one night. And, and then this is, and then, and then Bean Bunny is a little confused at this point because he's like, wait, hang on, you want me to do this? Because he says, because Scrooge says, go and, get, go and get that prize turkey and I'll give you five shillings. And Bean Bunny, it's the shillings part that Bean Bunny's like, wait, hang on, what? <laughs> and and he acts and and he actually tosses a, a bag of money down to uh, Bean Bunny to be able to um, to be able to get that to be able to get that turkey because because as it turns out he is as it turns out he's going to be heading to. Um, uh, he's going to be heading to Cratchit's house, but not off, but not before he speaks to a couple of others, including um, uh, including uh, the um, the two charity workers, the charity workers. Yes, uh, and I was like, I, I was I was trying to work. Of, I was trying to think of a name for them instead of using uh, Bunsen and Beaker. <laughs> again, <laughs> film characters, not Muppet names. That 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 was so that was so that has that has been really difficult to do throughout this episode. No denying that, folks. <laughs> but um, but we're getting there. Um, let's see, and let's see, he actually he actually whispers an amount to give to them, and it's just the look on their face. You're like, wait, you're gonna give us that much and not a penny mm-hmm. less. And he also he also assures them that there's back payments in there as well, which is absolutely incredible. Mm-hmm. But um, and then and then we and then we actually and then we actually hear Michael and then we hear Michael Caine singing here. And I thought, wait, Michael Caine can sing? Because mm-hmm. apparently, out, um, when he went into previously. apparently when he went into the according to Paul Williams, when he went into the recording booth to do it, he said, "I've no idea what I'm doing, but I'm going to do it anyway." Interesting. And he and he certainly and he certainly took it in his stride. Yeah. Um. That's it. And and then he, he visits a couple he visits a couple of other um, places as well. Gives them uh, some presents, and also heads to his workplace and gives each and gives uh, the uh, the bookmakers uh, a basket of coal, which uh, which did mm. um, which did confuse um, which did confuse some kids uh, during uh, test schools. Uh, where uh, in the commentary, f- uh, uh, the, the commentary for the film from the uh, the creators, uh, the creators relate a funny story from the test screenings. A few children asks what, a few children asked what the bookkeepers did to get coal at the end, and it had completely slipped the creators' minds that Santa does give bad children coal in their stockings. It had completely slipped the creators' mind that that does happen. Ah, uh, you can see the kids' logic there, but it's like, yeah. oh, kid, kid, you, don't you remember the setup from earlier? I don't, I don't think kid, I don't think the kids would have been paying too much attention to the setup. Yeah, ah, oh, that, that's a shame. But, <laughs> but still, but still, but still, it, but still that, that's that's a great, that's a great story though. It is. Um, this whole montage of Scrooge giving gifts. 
if there's one thing about it that I can personally nitpick, um, okay. when he's giving when he's giving uh, presents to Fred and to his wife Clara, it feels a little rushed to me because you know normally he like the whole thing of him um, yeah. like re reuniting with his only living family should be kind of a bigger deal than the movie makes of it. But yeah. I suppose I can understand. I, I can understand why it isn't as much since obviously in this telling of the story, the character of Fan has been deleted. So the yeah. weight of that family reconnection might not have been there. So you know, it's, it's not like yeah. it's done poorly in this case. I just wish it could have been done a bit more, if you know what I mean. Yeah, th there was th there was more to that particular part uh, of the um, uh, of the montage. Yeah, yeah <laughs> like it, maybe if it hadn't even been in the montage and been an actual small scene, and you know, but yeah, but whatever. It's still it's still good that it's there. I just wish it could have been expanded a bit. Yeah, and uh, and he, uh, I was like, and uh, one one of the other people that he goes to visit is of course his old headmaster Sam. Uh, but of course, the last place he goes to, and, he, and he's got he's got the entire town following him through all of this. And you've got you've got the um, you've got you've got one of the last songs of the film, uh, "Thankful Hearts." At this yep. point, and another song I love. Yeah, I was like, I was like, and then and then the last stop he makes is outside there, uh, Cratch's house, and then. You've got another great 180 here. Like, still, still coming, coming across <laughs> as intimidating towards Cratchit. And then you've got Emily coming out. It's just, just the exchange between the three of them is just brilliant. And then it finishes it. I'm about to raise your salary. And then Emily's like, and I'm about to raise your yada, yada, yada. And then, and then we're just like, wait, what? <laughs> But yeah, wait, wait, what? You're gonna raise my salary? <laughs> and and I was like, and then and and then and then the film finishes with everybody, everybody at the, at the table, and of course you've got that, and of course you've got that classic line. Um, oh, sounds like I've missed something. Well, I was just gonna say, um, you say everyone is there at the table, but that's not true. There is one th one element missing, which has led to a fan theory. Um, Fred's oh, fan Fred's theories. wife Fred's wife Clara is for some reason not there, and so Ooh. that led some people to theorize that she had died off screen. <laughs> what did he say? Hey! Oh. And they oh, even good grief. and they even. And they even asked Brian Henson if that was the implication. And he said, said no, that wasn't the implication at all. It's just that um, the actress who played her, uh, Robin Weaver, I believe. Uh, yeah, Robin Weaver, she was just unavailable for filming. Unavailable for filming for that particular scene on that day. Yeah. Uh, that, is, that, is, that is really, really unfortunate there for that. But, uh, but that being said... Uh, but that being said, we now have uh, we then get the um, that classic line towards the end of every Christmas Carol adaptation that we've uh, that we've ever had. God bless us, everyone. And it's interesting that you have Scrooge say it here because it's normally Tiny Tim that says it. Yeah. Well, yeah. I suppose um, they figured. Well, he's already said it once in the movie, so let's give this ah, second yes. one. So let's give this second one to Scrooge. Yeah, I mean, that's I mean, and then and then you get the um, and then you get the last song of the film when love is found. Mm. And let's say, well, say it, it, it's it's actually on the soundtrack. It's actually titled the the finale because you've got when love is found around that Christmas table, the end, uh, the end of the film, and then into the. Um, the end credits when you've got it feels like Christmas in the background once again. And there we go. That is the um, 
Uh, the and I love, was, um, the I love yeah. the final, I love the final line in the movie when Rizzo says, yeah. oh, "That was a, that was a really good story, Mister Dickens." And Gonzo says, <laughs> "Thanks. If you like it, you should read the book." <laughs> yes, uh, but yeah, like I say, there we go. That is the um, the Muppet Christmas Carol, and there we go. There's the classic. There's classic. Uh, there's the classic logo from. Uh, the start of the series, why would I? I have missed using this one, but yeah, <laughs> uh, but yeah, you can see why this is a firm fan favorite at this uh, time of year. And and now that you've and now that Disney have got um, various other uh, properties uh, under their belts, you can guarantee there's going to be more Christmas specials later down the road. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and I'll see this next year. Uh, I'm going to be looking at the Santa Claus trilogy. Ah, oh, nice. Yeah, because uh, because I did mention it when I was going through the uh, the Toy Story episodes for the King of Isolation that um, you've got Tim Allen in there. Does it? He he's like, huh? yeah, yeah, the guy that voices no, so right, just... yeah is in the Santa Claus movie. No, I know that. It's just that um, I had, I had to reference Tim Allen's famous. Huh? <laughs> yeah but um uh, but yeah um that's it that's it it's interesting that uh, they're not having tim allen voice buzz in the upcoming Lightyear film coming out next summer they've got chris pratt yeah which not a bad casting i suppose but yeah. but um, oh well but but uh, but one particular cast regarding Chris Pratt fans are not happy about is the fact they've got him voicing Mario in Illumination's upcoming Mario movie when you have Charles Martinet, the voice of Mario for many years, right freaking there! Unacceptable! Are, are you all right? <sighs> <laughs> You, you never it know. It's inevitable. I was going to get that out of my system in one of these videos at some point. You never know. It could be a pleasant surprise. Yeah. 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 A lot, And a lot of people said that about the Sonic film that came out last year. My word, the less said about yeah. that first trailer, the better. Oh, that was horrific. Uh, just, yeah. just get that original design uh, out of here. It, it's It's... It's cursed. It's cursed, I tell you. Yeah. And the fact that Paramount actually listened to the feedback and actually spent the time to redesign the character to make him look more like his <laughs> video game counterpart. I mean, fair play. Yeah. And the film, I mean, I, the film ended up being really good. Yeah, it did. And, you know, with that original design for Sonic, I completely get what they were going for, but it just, it just didn't work practically. Like, the idea of having, you know, a realistic Sonic, in Mm. theory, isn't isn't in and of itself. I know, but that's what I'm saying. In and of itself, it's not a bad idea, theoretically. But there are just some things which can't work realistically. Realistically. And that original design of Sonic was one of them. Exactly. Yeah. But my word, better mate, cannot wait for the sequel to come out next year. I so said we've actually got a number. Oh yeah. We've actually got a number of video game movies coming out next year uh, as well. Mm. Um was like Mario I've already mentioned from Illumination. Um Sonic we've just mentioned. We've got an uncharted movie on the way as mm. well. You've got Tom Holland as a younger Nathan Drake akin to like the age he was uh in one of the flashbacks from Uncharted 3 for those that have played the Uncharted games. And you've got Mark Wahlberg as a younger um, Sully, or uh, v- Victor Victor Sullivan, just to avoid the confusion with the uh, Sully from Monsters Inc. Like, whoa, that's unexpected casting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, uh, but yeah, but I say, I say, I've, I've played I've played the Uncharted games, and it is definitely up there as one of my favourite video game franchises out there. But um, I say there, I say I have seen rumblings, so take it with a pinch of salt, that they might have a new Uncharted series on the way involving um, uh, Nathan and Elena's uh, daughter, Cassie. 
So she could end up taking the mantle that Nathan Drake had done for the first four games of that series. Well, technically five if we include Golden Abyss on the PS Vita, but I don't think that one is uh, canon in like the main series. But um, Uncharted fans can let me know about that one in the comments. But uh, I was like, Mario, Sonic, Uncharted. You've got Light, you've got Lightyear coming out as a potential summer blockbuster as well. Uh, and then you've got all these Marvel, yeah. and then of course you've got your your staple of like two or three Marvel films coming out um, uh, next year uh, as well. And some pretty cool looking DC, some pretty cool looking DC properties too. Yes, you've got. I am you've got, so hyped for oh, Robert Pattinson's Batman. That looks so good. Yeah. Was it? Was it in the? In the was it? And uh, and you've also got you've we've also got another Indiana Jones film uh, on the way as well, oh, um, yeah. which makes. Um, which is actually which is actually set round about the time after the uh, Apollo Eleven uh, moon landings, and I actually, I mean, I didn't actually get to see any of the filming when it was in Glasgow, but there were a couple of days where I was in Glasgow, like towards the end of the day, and actually walking past the sets, I was like, oh, I've got, I've got to get a couple of pictures of this set. It looks amazing. <laughs> I, was like, I mean, I mean. With anything, with anything like that, I'm just, I, I just, I just take a few minutes. I'm just like in awe of what I'm seeing here. Mm. But anyway, uh, next thing. Anyway, the next thing we need to sort out is the scores. Uh, mm -hmm. There should be a couple of them. Um, trying to think. Uh, right, there we go. Uh, I can't really think of anything else that we need to. I can't really think of anything else we need to cover. Yeah, but um, but anyway, anyway, scores. Um, the I say uh, as uh, as as always. So we've got we've got five portions of the uh, the score to go through. We've got uh, the story, characters, visuals, soundtrack, and the legacy, the lasting impact this film has had since the film uh, came out. I originally had the category called Test of Time, uh, like which which sort of like tied into how well the film held up today. But um, but I felt changing it to legacy, the legacy the film has left behind actually works better. But, yeah. Um, but I must say, but uh, but I say, but but, that, but that, this is all for the benefit of the uh, newer viewers that have um, uh, come along into the um, into the kingdom uh, recently. And uh, and if this and if this is your first episode of the Kingdom of Isolation, welcome. We hope you enjoy your visit. Uh, maybe I should put maybe I should put that into my intro. Um, in the future anyway uh anyway story uh i definitely feel i definitely feel that um this is without a doubt one of the best adaptations of the original um source material uh some some of the changes yeah. that they made some of the changes some of the changes they made i, I feel i feel those changes worked and uh, but but like so I do say, i the, i say i say the, there were a couple of there were a couple of nitpicks that you did uh, yeah, like up. like one or two things I I wished they could have included, but there was nothing that um, you know they changed that I felt oh that's that's a bad change you know right. like it still got it still um, got everything across that was essential yeah. to the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know. I mean, I can't I can't really think of any bad changes myself on my end. So no, so. We'll give it a we'll give it a ten on this occasion. Yeah, go on. There, there we go. There we go. We've, there we go. We've got the first ten on the board, folks. Um, so characters. Again, like I mentioned earlier, with how well each Muppet fit each of the main Muppets fitted their respective roles. Yeah. I mean, I I on, I honestly cannot think of anything that would change as far as the casting. Of each Muppet was um, concerned for which character that they would um, uh, portray. E even no, even some it, of the Muppets that were created specifically for this film, even they, yeah, they even they had their own yeah, charm to them as well. Yeah, and they perfectly embodied the way the characters were in the source material. You know? Exactly, and yeah. it was um, absolute. It was absolutely for the best that they didn't go with uh, the classic Muppets as the ghosts because yeah. then it would just just have been like well this is kind of kind of silly at this point yeah. you know what i mean but, 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 and, and it would have yeah, and, and it helped that it helped that 
No, I was going to say it, it helped that um, the creators obviously knew these Muppet characters so well that mm-hmm. they realized, okay, this would be this Muppet would be perfect for this role. You know, mm-hmm. they went into it with all the knowledge and passion for the characters. Yeah, and and um, and, and like and like I was about to say, um, I, was like, I, I I honestly cannot think I honestly cannot think of any like changes to the casting that we would have done. But the biggest thing, the biggest thing that's going to help, the biggest thing that helps the score get another 10 here is Michael Caine as Scrooge. What can we say Mm -hmm. about his portrayal of this character that we haven't already said? I love how um, uh, he's very, you know, subtle in his coldness a lot of the time with occasional bursts of anger. Yeah. But... But I love how it feels there's a natural progression with yeah. his, uh, you know, becoming more nice. Because there yeah. are some tellings where, where it kind of feels like, well, this is, you know, like feels a little forced, perhaps. Like yeah. that, there's never been, from my experience, a version of A Christmas Carol where you don't buy that he is becoming nice. But some of them handle it better than others, you yeah. know? But this one was handled very well, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, the, the, I mean, the natural progression, like you mentioned there, uh, was like I said, with that, with with the uh, the subtle hints of um, uh, intimidation, f- with, with the occasional uh, full on uh, outburst, it actually got me thinking of how similar that is to Vincent Price's portrayal of Ratigan in The Great Mouse Detective. Yeah, kind of. So, so you, you can see you can see some of the similarities there with the um with the progression both those characters go through. Only in Ratigan's case, he he goes he ends up reaching the point where he just becomes full on animalistic. Yeah, what well, while Scrooge goes from bad to good, Ratigan goes from bad to worse. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So I say, I, say I, I feel I feel the characters definitely get I feel the characters definitely get a ten on them um, uh, on that one. And the cameras have frozen, frozen again, again on my end. Uh, not ideal. Not ideal. Why? <laughs> that's the third. That's the third one of the day. Hopefully, the last one. Thankfully we're, thankfully, we're nearly the end of the episode anyway. Oh, boy. But anyway, uh, but like I say, characters get a 10. So that's two, so that's two 10s on the board so far. Uh, visuals. This is, a, this, is a tough, this is a tough one to score, given the fact that it's an older uh, live action film and like with some of the effects that, we, that we've brought up previously. Uh, I mean, yeah, like I say, some of the, see, some of the effects, they... Like I said, with the, with the flying and the, the wires and the green screen, things like that. It's... Hang on. <laughs> Why? Of all the days. <laughs> of all the, the days. wonders of technology, yeah? Uh, push comes to shove, I may need to use a different... Push comes to shove, I may need to use different software. Might need to use something like Microsoft Teams or something along those lines, but anyway. <clears throat> yeah, cross that bridge if we come to it. Yes, yes, we will. So, like I say, visuals. I'm I'm finding it I'm finding it difficult what what to give it as far as the score is concerned because, like you've brought up, some of the some of the effects like there like the fl- flying through the sky with the wires and the green screen. It looks pretty. It looks it looks obvious now, but it wasn't as obvious back then. So, yeah. so, so, so we need so we need to take that into account. Uh, but but mm-hmm. some of the effects like but then but then you also need to take into account the uh, was the water yeah the water for the Ghost of Christmas Past especially that was really well done. So yep. that sort the, of helps um, balance it out. Yep, the uh, um, barrel for the scene with Kermit walking yes. uh, for Bob Cratchit. Tiny Tim, that's 
very, very clever. Indeed. So, I think I need to, I I need to close that down. Right, there we go. Uh, so we've got that. Oh, no, 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 don't, this, don't do this to me. Don't do this to me. Don't do this to me. I thought it was oh, going to crash again. You, no, you've defrosted. <laughs> defrosted winter Christmas. That was that. Okay, okay. That, that was like one of the easier ones to, one of the easier jokes to make. But um, I'll say. Thank you. Uh, but yeah, I think taking everything into account, I mean, yes, one or two of the visual effects do look dated now, but taking into account some of the other effects that they managed, they've managed to pull off as well, still hold up really well, uh, yep. especially, especially on the practical side of things with that shot that we mentioned earlier. And the scene transitions as well, especially that spiral into the... Mm-hmm. Um, into the Christmas yet to come. Mm-hmm. Uh, 9.5 for that one. Yeah, that's fair. And the soundtrack now. Uh, again, because, I mean, the songs, the songs overall are fantastic. The songs are fantastic throughout. Uh, yeah. And you and the um, and then, the, and then of course the score as well. Another fa- another fantastic addition to the um, uh, the film. Uh, mm-hmm. This this is another one of those cases where I can't really I can't really fault it. No, no. Nope. So... The the songs are all catchy. The music, um, the, the the score is perfect for keeping up the mood. Yeah, it, it, it I say yes, each part of the score fits the emotional beat that it's aiming for for that particular scene. Mm-hmm. So that's a, that's another ten on the board. But now into the legacy of this mm. film. So um, the uh, production. Um, so yeah. So like, so like, well, like I mentioned, uh, this was the first major uh, Muppet production uh, after Jim Henson's uh, passing in May of 1990, which resulted in the directorial duties being handed to uh, Brian, uh, his son. And with, with the praise that he got from uh, Michael Caine, who, like you've mentioned earlier, was completely unaware that it was, it was his director, uh, directorial debut until a couple of weeks into filming, he certainly mm-hmm. took it in his stride for his first directorial uh, credit. He did a fantastic job with making he did. Uh, the film. Uh, uh, this was originally going to be a TV special initially. But to me, I'm actually glad it became a film. And so am I. Yeah. And, I'm, pr- and I'm, pretty sure, I'm pretty sure a lot of people will be on that same boat uh, as Definitely. well. Definitely. I mean, I mean, it did do it did do relatively well at the box office. Um, it was uh, December eleventh, nineteen ninety two. That was the release date for it. Um, um, twelve million, uh, twelve million dollar budgets, which is which is fairly reasonable for for a Muppet film. Uh, Twenty seven million dollars worldwide at the box office. Um, but like I say, it did do relatively well. The only thing it's, that stopped it from gaining more at the box office was the competition it had at the time with another Christmas classic, my personal favorite in the franchise, Home Alone 2, Lost in New York, which was released at around the same time. So, so there, was competition from, ah. there was competition from Home Alone 2. Um, but that being said, but that's been said. Let's say it's a twenty-seven million dollars, so effectively making double its budget. So, uh, so in my eyes, I would class that as a box, box office success, making making just over yeah. double its budget. Mm-hmm. Uh, re- so the critical response—that's what we're after. Seventy-six um, percent on uh, Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, the general, uh, the site's consensus saying it may not be the finest version of Charles Dickens' tale to grace the screens, but The Muppet Christmas Carol is a funny and heartwarming 
is funny and heartwarming and serves as a good introduction to the story for younger viewers, like you mentioned earlier. Yep. Um, score on Metacritic, not as good in Rotten Tom- as Rotten Tomatoes, only 64 on, um, uh, on Metacritic, but it did get an average grade of A on the A plus to F scale on cinema score. So it got, so it had that in its favor. Um, the, um, three out of five stars from Alma uh, Haf- Hafliderson of the, uh, the BBC at the time, writing a um, liberal, liberal but fun adaptation of a classic that turns out to be quite touching as Muppet movies go. Uh, less pleasing are the forgettable songs that offer both clumsy word construction and dire music that eats away at the aesthetic quality of the movie. Completely disagree. Yeah. Uh, home, I say the home media release now. Um, uh, first released on VHS in the US on November 5th, 1993, and then on, the no- on November 15th, uh, a couple of weeks later in the UK, later on DVD in both countries. The first US DVD release was on October 8th, 2002, and it was in, f- in, the, in a full screen only. Uh, format so that that would have been the um the four three ratio i think as I'm, I'm pretty sure it would have been the four three ratio i might be wrong on that one um uh they did re-release the film on dvd on november 29th 2005 in conjunction with kermit's 50th anniversary uh and this time the dvd contained both full screen and widescreen presentations and the UK also had similar DVD releases there as well. Uh, there was a 20th anniversary collector's edition of the film on Blu-ray, DVD, and digital on November 6, 2012. The release, however, did not include the extended cut, but the song When Love Is Gone and its accompanying scene can be viewed in its entirety on the full screen version of the anniversary edition, although it is cut from the widescreen format. So, uh, uh, so we've got that. And um, and it's um, and now and, now, and like we mentioned earlier, now that we're approaching the film's 30th anniversary, there is there is rumblings that 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 it could be added into um, the 30th anniversary re-release which means we could end up seeing that scene in widescreen for the first time. There's a very strong possibility we could get that scene in widescreen for the first time for the film's 30th anniversary. And hey, if we're lucky, we could end up with a 4K Blu-ray release of this film. Which, oh, that would uh, be we, amazing. I mean, I mean, it would require a fair chunk of work to remaster it into 4K quality, but it would be worth it. I was like, I, 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 Absolutely. I, definitely, I definitely think it would be worth it. And, and like I mentioned right at the start of the episode, there are families and uh, one of my friends out there, um, there are a number of people um, across the world that have this film on their watch list every year. And some of them even go to the, go to the length of watching it on Christmas Eve with, with their families as well. And it's even been a staple on a number of occasions over the years in the uh, UK TV uh, Christmas schedules as well. Sometimes even being shown on Christmas Eve mm-hmm. itself. So mm-hmm. I'm, tr- I'm trying to think. Do I give it a ten or an eleven for the legacy? Well, I mean, considering um, uh, it's still getting re-releases, including theatrical re-releases, I think that in itself shows that it's having a lasting effect. And the fact that, as I said, it was a lot of kids' introductions to this great story. So indeed, gets an eleven because of that. Yeah, go on. There we go. So there we go. Um, so it's certainly um, one of my um, favorite tellings of the story. I absolutely love the story, and I love seeing loads of different versions. Me personally, I wouldn't say it's my absolute favorite telling of the story. It's certainly one of my very favorites. Uh, my two favorites are 
the 1984 TV movie with George C. Scott as Scrooge. Yes. And and Scrooged with Bill Murray. Bill Murray, which yes, is, that one I'm familiar with. Where, yeah, where Scrooge is a, uh, a TV executive. That's right. And it's my favorite Christmas movie of all time. Hard to argue with that. Um, I also uh, I can yeah. I can also highly recommend uh, I can highly recommend the versions with Alistair Sim, Patrick Stewart, and I have a soft spot for the ones with Kelsey Grammer and Tim Curry. Ah yes, Kelsey Grammer and Tim Curry, otherwise known as uh, in Kelsey Grammer's case, Sideshow Bob from The Simpsons and uh, Tim Curry. Where do we begin with his resume? <laughs> but uh, that be that being said, though, um... I was just thinking of um, versions of Christmas Carol. There, there was another one which I've just remembered. Uh, this animated version called simply Christmas Carol the Movie, with uh, hmm. Simon Callow as the voice of Ebenezer Scrooge, and. You'll you'll never guess who does the voice of Jacob Marley. Okay, right, hang on. Uh, this is where I'll need the uh, Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time music in the background, where the doodle, um, which I, which I've used in a couple of episodes previously. Um, so, who did? Okay, who did they have as Jacob Marley? Nicholas Cage. What? <laughs> yeah. Nicholas Cage as Jacob Marley. Oh, <laughs> no, not the spirits, not the spirits. It's that's never gonna get old. No, no. And uh, when I first saw this version of A Christmas Carol, um, I hated it when I first saw it because Scrooge is a lot more kind and gentle in a way. To begin with, he's still a grumpy git, but he has a much softer edge to begin with, and it ends with much more of a speck of hope that he might be able to re reconnect with um, his ex fiance. So, you know, with that in mind, I absolutely hated this version of it. Mm -hmm. But looking back on it, because at the start of the movie, yeah, it begins with. Um, Simon, a live action Simon Callow as Charles Dickens giving Ooh. a reading of okay. giving a reading of the book as Charles himself was wont to do. But mm -hmm. um, he suddenly sees a mouse walking across, running across the stage, and he's like, "You know, I'm going to tell a slightly different version of this story." So, okay, going into it with that mindset, I can kind of appreciate the film a bit more, and I might even rewatch it because I'm thinking. Maybe I was a bit too harsh on it. You know, it's certainly, yeah. yeah, like, so watch it as not a direct adaptation of the book, but more an alternate take. I will definitely, I will definitely uh, keep that in mind. Still, Nicholas mm. Cage as Jacob Marley, though. Yeah, I, I don't know why they went with that casting choice. <laughs> yeah, Consider, considering how eat... off the wall he can be sometimes. He doesn't even go full cage rage. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, th th this this must have been before the cage rage thing came into uh, became a thing. It, it must have done. But anyway, um, anyway, the scores are now in, and uh, the only other uh, the only other um, special that I've done uh, apart from the anniversary specials because that, that's just like just like a, a retrospective. Um, an episode similar to this. Uh, I did the Nightmare Before Christmas last year, which had a score of eighty six percent. This one, I'll say this: it managed to beat it by some margin, hundred and one percent. Yes, yes. All right. So as it stands, Muppet Christmas Carol is top of the specials list. But, uh, the, but uh, could we have a worthy adversary in the form of another staple of the Christmas TV schedules here in the UK, Mary Poppins? 
And the only Ooh. way to find it, the only way to find out is to unwrap that Christmas present tomorrow. But in the meantime, Alan, once again, thanks for joining me for this um, uh, the, this first of two uh, Christmas specials. Can't wait to get you back on board uh, later down the road for um, uh, for future episodes. Yep, it's always fun being here. Yeah, indeed. As I, I mean, as I say, as I say, one of the things I love about having Alan here is just it's just how well, as as with all the guests that I've had previously, is how well we're able to work off each other. Yeah. But um, but I say, we we definitely at some point need to try, like try and meet up in person. We Hell yeah. Need, we definitely need to get that arranged at some point. Uh huh. Uh, but we'll but again we'll cross that bridge when we get to it but anyway i uh, hope you guys enjoyed this episode covering the muppets uh, christmas carol for the first of two christmas specials this year if you did hit the thumbs up and if you want to leave us a, a, a present um as well in the kingdom of isolation and you want to be part of it as well you can uh hit the subscribe button down at the bottom and click the bells join the uh dream chasers notifications to, to join the notification squad so you don't miss anything that we do on here uh tomorrow christmas day we've got the we've got mary poppins and then and then after that it will be into the new year with the next pixar film i'll be covering which will be finding nemo but until then folks we will see you guys next time in the kingdom of isolation have a very merry christmas and a happy new year god bless us everyone